morning, it's uh, Gavin White here from uh, Auto Tech Recruit. I hope everyone's well. Uh, with me today, um, we've got Colin Cleghorn from uh, director from uh, Formative Limited. How are you doing, Colin? You okay? Really good, thanks for asking. Yep, enjoying the sunshine this morning. Pretty good yeah. here where we are. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? I was up out walking the dog at um, about seven o'clock this morning. It was absolutely gorgeous out there. So, so thanks for coming on today, Colin. Um, obviously, we've got to know one another over the uh, probably over the last year or so and uh, trying to do uh, uh, do some work together um, over the last year or so. Um, so how, how are you finding things at the moment? Do you want to give us a bit of an update on what Formative do and, and let everybody know who you are and what you guys do? Yeah, of course. Yeah, be, be delighted. So I'm Colin Glinkhorn. I'm one of the directors at Formative and we're 26, 27 years trading as an automotive consultancy and training business so we're based in Buckingham just um, west of Milton Keynes so we try and provide support to manufacturers and dealer groups and dealers independent motor traders all the people that work with us are either manufacturer based previously or they run their own garages etc so we tend to know a lot of the sharp end beliefs and stories about what really works in the industry so we, we tend to try and help on process business improvement and more recently, uh, we've been looking very closely using our auditing skills at MOTs. So I'm happy today to have a good old discussion with yourself about MOTs and what's going to happen both currently and for the future on MOTs. I was, I was in the British Army for a long time and that tends to give me a little bit of an extra edge perhaps when I'm looking and communicating with people about what effectively they need to do. Um, not so much stick and carrot, just do or die really we really enjoy the control that an MOT auditor kind of can give and support the businesses so mm. delighted to still obviously have a good connection with the motor trade live and breathe it so really uh, obviously got lots of uh, anecdotal stories as we've all got in the motor trade etc so happy to chat for a little while with you now about what, um, what, you, what you're looking to try and understand and what we do yeah good well I think it's a it's a relevant subject at the moment obviously um the six month extension on uh, MOTs has had a big impact certainly in the aftermarket and uh, and servicing centres. Um, you know, there has been some talk on the grapevine recently that that, that may be getting, um, coming to an end, who knows, we'll see. Um, but the, um, of, you know, I think uh, there was some data that was, uh, I was on a trade user group call a couple of weeks ago and I think up until that point, I think from the 30th of March to a couple of weeks ago, there was something like 2.4 million vehicles that hadn't had an MOT test that should have had one. You know, that, that figure's probably well over 3 million now, I would have thought. So, you know, um, potentially some spikes coming back, you know, <laughs> if that if that six months either gets reduced or, or extended. But the, the reality is, you know, there, there's obviously going to be some vehicles that need to uh, need to be tested. Um, tested. Definitely. And I think the other thing to be clear, I suppose, you know, for, for any people that don't necessarily understand the MOT or, or are connected to the MOT industry like we are, um, you can actually still get an MOT done at the moment. It's not the, gov the government's not saying you can't get it done. It's just a six month extension to give people a little bit of grace if needed. So I know. And everybody yeah, took that quite literally. Yeah, I think there's been a bit of confusion out there from the consumer to say, oh, that's fine. I don't need to get it done for six months or I haven't got to spend any money on my car. But, you know, you're seeing quite a few videos and that on a lot of the Facebook groups and that that we're connected to at the moment where there's some pretty horrific vehicles that are coming in with bits falling off from everywhere. And they're quite clearly dangerous, you know. So um, so anyway, let's, you know, let's, let's talk more about some of them issues and. And actually, while, while there is the downtime at the moment, it's a great time to do some auditing for companies, isn't it? So, absolutely. You know, you, yeah. you spend a lot of time coaching businesses within the automotive aftermarket. Um, what's your general feeling amongst these owners at the moment and how are they doing? I think the ones that I speak to are generally very positive. We've accepted the situation as it mm -hmm. is. And there's actually been a long lockdown. It's uh, what we're into nine weeks or something now. And they're really keen to get going. I think they've weathered the storm well, the um, support with the uh, furlough payments, et cetera, has helped a lot of businesses retain their good staff, which is essential for all of us. But now I think as a nation, we're quite industrious. We want to get back to it. You know, we don't need to be told to stand up and be ready. That's, that's our, our nature. That's part of yeah. who we are. I think a lot of businesses, Gavin, are quite nervous 
about what the future looks like. It's going to be a changing market for them, for their staff, and inevitably for the customers as well. There's always an ens- a sense of nervousness and reticence about actually what do we need to do, how do we do it, etc. And I know we've got an opportunity to talk over the next um, half hour, 40 minutes or so about some of the steps that they can take to actually get themselves a little bit more ready to open the doors, etc. I think, again, we adapt well under pressure. That's the motor trade. We're very used to having to deal with situations and work out what the best outcome is for our customers. The ones I've spoken to, Gavin, have said time and time again about parts supply, that they, they could open their doors earlier, but they, if they haven't got any parts supply, we can only rely on our own sort of core stock for some yeah. um, period. Inevitably, specifically with the MOTs, you get additional repairs, and what those additional repair requirements often require parts. So it's not yeah. just the labor only, which we can we can obviously cope with, et cetera. I think that the change is going to come, but the expected change on our customers is something that we will not necessarily today still look the same in a month or three months or six months time. I think we'll need to adapt again. And look, we've made mistakes. You know, we, we, we haven't been allowed really to go back too early. I think the support that we've given for the NHS and, I'm sure like you, Gavin, we've seen some brilliant posts of what people have been doing to go the extra mile for the uh, key workers, which is truly commendable and puts a bit of a lump in your throat when you think the extras that those people have gone through and not just our Thursday clapping, but, you know, the motor traders supported yet again, um, you know, our whole country, not just as a, you know, tens of billions of pounds of industry contributed, you know, as revenue, actually, when needs be, we know we can rely on our technicians our service advisors, our managers to go in and still do work and put themselves at risk. So. Yeah, and keep the country mobile. That's the main thing. Isn't it? Without, without yeah, mobility, yeah, for sure. Without mobility, none of it works, does it? So, yeah. No, definitely not. And and I, I, I promise I won't fill the next hour or so with military quotes. You'll you'll dig me for it later when we meet up. But you know, the the army are all about training hard and fighting easy. That when in quiet times, keep training, training, keep getting better, practice your processes, do things differently, throw in a couple of scenarios that actually could arise. What do we do if, and then, then fight easy, you know, that when it comes to it, you're prepared for it. So now, as you said, it's the best time ever to look at the processes, look at what we do with our people. How do we deal with this situation? What do we do if we've got customers who can't pay cash? Well, we're ready for it. What do we do if we've got customers who can't come into the business? Well, we're ready for it. And I think those sort of situations, they're the things that we should be doing a lot more of right now. Yeah, no, I agree. So moving on to some more about around MOT testing. So what advice would you give to ensure that MOT testing stations are meeting both audit guidelines while ensuring that they're complying with the COVID-19 measures? Now, I know this is, this is a, a very key subject in terms of the reduction of um, the MOT um, extension at the moment. Uh, it's something that obviously DVSO are working with the trade closely on at the moment is how do you keep an MOT tester safe? How do you keep the consumer safe? Now, if, if you haven't got a lot, lot one man testing lane, um, yeah, actually it's a two man testing lane, you, you need an MOT assistant, you know, that, that's quite hard to keep people uh, in, in a social distance, you know, uh, social distancing in that, if that's going to be the case moving forward. So, you know, what, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I mean, look, as a, as a VTS, we've been self-regulating for a few years now. You know, we've, we've, we've not had the visits that perhaps in the past we'd have been used to the AE coming round and visiting. You get a, a, a relationship with those people. So it's no great surprise that when a new piece of regulation comes in or advice or guidance, we've got to adopt that. We shouldn't just allow somebody to police it and then be told we're doing it wrong after the event. Mm. So I think, you know, as a, as a, as a rule, we've been doing really well. There is some guidance from the government and I posted on LinkedIn um, a couple of weeks ago about the five step plan from health and safety executive about what needs to be done just as a simple step by step. And as you rightly mentioned about safe working, about effective use of PPE, et cetera. And the example you gave, absolutely, you know, very poignant in that, you know, if we've got one technician going in and out of a car and all of a sudden he now needs an assistant to do the, hasn't got one lane testing and he's got to do the brake efficiencies and turn the steering wheel, then that, of course, introduces another person to that vehicle. So the cleanliness of the car going back to the customer is going to be so, so key. Likewise, that's now two technicians 
that are climbing in and out of that car. So yeah. we, we, we have this guide and I'd encourage anyone to have a look at that post or maybe contact Neil Gavin after the event and I can send that to you separately, et cetera. That, that, that change to the way we have to self-regulate. Now, they, the HSE have said through local departments that they will visit periodically. So we shouldn't assume that we're never going to get a visit, but we must adopt ourselves in the same way as we do for normal MOT standards to keep a check, have a look at that, that five step plan that has got all the detail in it and make sure that the people that work there follow it as well. What yeah. we get often is, as, as if you saw the post, the manager signs it. So the manager says that he or she is satisfied the business is operating that way. But you and I both know human nature is such, Gavin, that yeah. you know when, when we're not being watched, do we always do what we're supposed to do? And probably yeah. not. So yeah. sometimes that's our benefit. We, 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 we've done well as an industry because we've learned to get around situations. Well, with this, we can't. There can be no deviation. They've got to do it and they've got to do it right. So follow yeah. those guidelines that are already in place and hopefully that'll um, you know, put us in good stead if ever we do get checked at. Yeah. And I suppose the other thing is as well, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about you know, technicians in and out of a, a customer's car uh, and what they're, but you know, there's also the employee safety in all of this as well. You know, as we slowly start to come out of lockdown, more and more people are interacting, you know, God forbid, you know, there is second, second, third, fourth peaks of this. You know, the, the reality is there are still going to be people that are going to be susceptible to this virus, you know, and, you know, if, if you're a couple of technicians all working in a, in a quite a close, you know, some of the workshops we go to, as I'm sure you go to on a regular basis, are, are pretty tight and well crammed in, um, you know, so it, it, it's inevitable that these guys are going to cross paths at some point in a workshop. So, you know, for an MOT testing facility, certainly, or any garage for that matter, I know obviously the dealerships are very, very good at this but you know and have probably had a lot of support and backup from the oems on this but i would imagine for a lot of independent garages this is this is quite a tough tough challenge for them to sort of really sort of mobilize and strategize for and and and, and get their employee buy-in you know to to make this happen you know so it most definitely is and um i think one of the most obvious quotes is as a as a, as a gp or your doctor would say you know prevention is better than cure so if we can take time to prevent it, even though it might feel like it's a challenge, it's something different, why do we need to do it this way? Well, because the, the other side of not doing it is far worse than doing it. So mm -hmm. that we've, we've got to follow the rules, make sure that the people that work alongside the, the customers, you know, our front of house people, be that an IMT, it could well be the owner or the technician, uh, maybe in a, a retail business, it's the service advisors, maybe workshop controllers, that they are seen and adopting that best practice. They've got to lead by example, let everybody see it, understand it, and then we've got a chance of staying open. The danger is, as you have already alluded, if we don't get it right and there's a second or third peak, they might, you know, heaven help, take us longer to go back to work properly and then put even stricter measures against us. I know when you go shopping now, you go to the supermarkets and all that, it's a completely changed experience. Mm. Screens, dividers, you know, queuing to get in and out and, you know, we, 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 yeah. we don't want to have to go down that level and contactless payments and, you know, been out of, you know pay, take uh, contact communication with customers via email and things like that. We're ready for it. We do it now. There's just going to be more of it coming. Yeah. So do you think there's been sufficient guidance from the government and regulatory bodies within the automotive industry to support, support the aftermarket at the moment? It's, it's an interesting one. And <clears throat> I'm not politically biased in any way. I don't have an allegiance one way or the other but I think based on what we've been faced with I think I've done really well mm. um, I think people are expecting a bit more when the potential lockdown was going to be released or, or slowly let go and that didn't quite happen fair play but um, uh, you know a, a, a really good friend of mine is a 28 year time served nurse and, and she basically said to me and my wife don't go out stay in yeah, and yeah. she really meant it and and that that advice, I think the majority of people have followed where they can, of course, but the 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 guidance I think has been almost by shock that if you don't do it, this is the potential, this is the the, the racking up of the numbers and the fatalities. And we have some guidance now. Um, we are regularly, and everybody will tell you, go online, have a look at the gov.uk sites, go to the HSE sites, and you'll see what we're 
I used to do. So it's not been great. I think it's better than it perhaps could have been. You look at other countries, though, Gavin, and you see where they are. It's a brand new thing. We've never had to deal with it before. So who would have known whether garages can get hold of PPE, you know, whether they've got, you know, safe working opportunities. Some of the IMTs that we go in, it would be very difficult to force, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a metre gappage, etc. So um, we've, we've, we've got to understand what we're responsible for and not belittle it in any way. So it, it's the best it could have been. I think that's the best yeah. way I can answer it without, um, you know, labouring in it more. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's an unforeseen, uncharted. It's nothing. There's a and, and no country's been doing it the same, have they? You know, so it's uh, uh, there is, nobody's better than the other Gavin. No, no. So, so the um for the automotive aftermarket after sales, and I know this is really your you know your forte, um, and the, you know the many years you've spent, um, not only working in the industry but doing the training. So after sales are likely to increase eventually due to the aging car park potentially and the delay in MOTs. How can they prepare for this? Yeah, I think you're right. We know it's coming um, a bit like a, a freight train. It's slow. It's on the move. We can't stop it. It's inbound. And, and I've, I've been a fan. We, we follow a lot of the um, proven technology where we have timed appointments. So it's absolutely essential. We get businesses not to do as, we used to when I first came into the trade, which is everybody arrives at eight o'clock and everybody picks their car up at five o'clock, even if it was in for a first service, you know, so timed appointments throughout the day. I think the customers will understand it because a lot of their shopping now, if they're doing online shopping, they've got to be in a certain place at a certain time to receive their deliveries. Well, guess what? Same in our industry. Mm. So having dedicated time where we see fewer people, we still see the same amount, but they're spread out throughout the day. And pre-booking of those, be it contact centres or online, again, is just going to smarten what we do. And, and I know lots of businesses that only now work that way. They only operate that. Of course, you get walk-ins and breakdowns. That's the nature of our industry. But they having a, fa a facility where the customer can, within maybe a two-hour block, pick a time slot, etc. We want the service advisors to sync a lot more with parts. And we know if they can do the pre-picking, the pre-ordering, get a lot more synchronized with what work is required and known to be coming in, um, allowing for the old Pareto's rule of 80-20, the bulk of our work is repeated again and again. So we can be smart about that. The way we meet customers, the way we greet them, again, in days gone by, you mentioned training there. You know, I would have stood in front of a class and told them that it's good practice to stand up and shake the customer's hand. Well, Maybe we've got to change that. Maybe we need to adapt to what we do. You know, a nice positive smile, step forward, but without the handshake, gloves or not. I mentioned PPE there. And again, we've got to understand when it's to be used, how it's to be used. And again, I've got a little guide on PPE, which I can gladly share. Um, lots of businesses have got to be tuned into that. But if they're not sure what to do, then I've got a little um, aid memoir, shall we say, a little bit of a help for people about PPE and how to source it and how to use it and to demonstrate. And again, I don't want to repeat myself too many times here, but the manager showing and leading and doing it will help enormously for those people who are then going to do it. And that's, um, that's the way I see it. I wonder, you mentioned about changes in our business, whether we do get a scrappage scheme or not. There's a lot of people asking for it. There's a fair few murmurs going on about whether we get it. Um, as you know, it was fantastic for, you know, getting people out of cars that just really weren't going to be fit for purpose. No good for us in the MOTs. We want to see the yeah. older vehicles, et cetera, in the MOT for, you know, labor and part sales, et cetera. But generally for the health of, you know, the globe, certainly the UK market, a scrappage scheme might, if it does come about, have an effect. And we need to, again, be thinking about that and part exchanging vehicles accordingly. We are now seeing more of the zero or low emission hybrid type vehicles coming through. And we know, Gavin, that has an effect on the MOTs. Mm. They are typically uh, less time to do for an MOT. There's less checks, obviously, no exhaust emissions, you know, um, no waiting for the heating of the engine to occur, et cetera. So that, that needs to be a factor and will affect after sales operations, um, mm. it's particularly for the IMTs that may not have sold them, but are looking after them for the customers. And um, I think I think that's some of the strategies people should be getting ready for and planning. 
Yeah, I think absolutely. And I think there, there is some positive. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of what you read at the moment, obviously April's car sales were horrific, probably the worst we've ever seen for God knows how long. Um, but, you know, three or four years ago, we did have record car sales, you know, and a lot of those vehicles that were probably purchased on PCPs, fleet deals, you know, a lot of those vehicles are going to start coming around again. So people are either just going to carry on taking those vehicles on, buy them, come out of not renew a PCP, go and buy a used car. The reality is, you know, with the government's message, try and steer clear of public transport at the moment. The reality is you would like to think that may be a big aid in actually kickstarting the car sales side, whether it's new or used, who knows? Um, I think only the consumers will ultimately decide that or um, or a scrappage scheme or depending on what crazy, you know, I've noticed a few emails dropping in my inbox from uh, fleet fleet dealers and brokers trying to uh, <laughs> send us some crazy deals out there at the moment for obviously vehicles that are stuck in compounds waiting to be plated and sold so um, it's going to be interesting I think for the remainder of this year in terms of how that stimulates that side of it but yeah. you know year on year garages are roughly known um, when the peaks of the business will occur you know March September we know that doing what we do as a recruitment agency you know March and September are our bumper months um, but with the extension of the MOT test period, will this inevitably disrupt it in, in your view over the next 12 months? You know, how can testing stations prepare for that? Yeah, well, um, we're not going to avoid it. There's absolutely no, no, no a way of getting out of it. And, and like you, yeah, we work with a lot of IMTs, the, the groups, as well as individual dealers. And to a man, they deliver great service. They really do, given a chance when the ducks are all lined up in a row it, it works it's it, it sinks correctly the the danger comes of course when people try and shortcut the service they kind of think oh i don't need to do that bit of it i'll, I'll bypass it and just jump straight to the sale instead of trying to maybe look at the customer inquiry first and any slight deviation can really affect what the customer wants the the preparation for what we know is coming um, I think all comes back to a good CRM system, good processes, keeping in touch with your customers. That's where the IMTs are so good. They know their customer base. They know them by name. They know the family associated with them. And when we see that there's an influx of business coming, you can't just turn on good service. You've got to be good at what you do. And again, sounds like I'm an old chestnut repeating itself, but investing in our people, our training those people, having good people. And, and that's why we furloughed. We furloughed because we wanted to keep retention and keeping those people now fully up to speed, understanding the processes. There's a phrase thrown around oftenly and that's frictionless service. And that's just making it easy for people to do business with us. Mm. If we remove barriers, if we stop making it difficult to do trade with us, then the customers will come because as you rightly say, they've got to have the work done. And I've always applauded uh, PCPs and, you know, short-term loan schemes, because that puts a newer vehicle into the marketplace. That's more customers wanting to look after their vehicle. Mm -hmm. If we only ever kept the first car we had, and that's probably my father's generation or the one before him, where mm -hmm. you bought your car and you kept your car, that was your car. What do you mean get a new car? You know, that's, that's your car and you'll keep it and repair it and probably pass it on within the family. You know, yeah. we've, 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 we've got a... Probably um, repair it on your own driveway if you can, yeah absolutely and they were fixable in those days yeah. gavin you know there wasn't a cover on it with you know sort of sort of six lock bolts that you can't actually access without special yeah. tools etc so we've got a ford fiesta in our household and that's we're on to our third user now you know it's been passed from my wife to my daughter to my son and you know that's that's sort of as they've got a bit different in their motoring needs but there's nothing wrong with the car the car's perfectly yeah. serviceable and and i think i've got a i've got a a mantra that we follow when we do a lot of the auditing and that is if you can't measure it you can't manage it so mm. putting a stake in the ground and saying hey that's our score that's where we are that's our mark as a percentage or color ratio amber or something all of that type of checking then gives us a base on which to say okay where's the gaps what do we need to do and again that's a that's a, a big part really about any disruption we've had we need to now say right ground zero where do we move from here how do we move it to the next level? And, and I think businesses are ready for it. They just need to reignite, really. They need to remember that all of the good stuff we've learned and we've done and start putting that into practice, perhaps with distancing, PPE, 
talking to our customers, explaining to our customers that they need to give a bit more time when they come in. It's not yeah. drop the keys and go because, you know, we need to cleanse the car. We're going to have to do different handover procedures. Maybe de um, I can just imagine demo drives are going to change. You know, I know, I know it's more on the sales side, but likewise, if we've got a technician doing a test drive for the customer, we want to go out and make sure that the customer's experiencing the same problems as us. All of that might have to change. Mm. And I've got a few comments in a minute about videos and using videos. So we'll see if we think that um, could be a way of moving smart forward. It's interesting you mentioned about the IMTs. Um, you know, we, we, we've seen a little uh, bit more activity this week, certainly, and uh, inquiries coming in for temporary vehicle technicians and MOT testers. And um, actually, m the majority of them have come from IMTs. Now, um, you know, the, the point you just made there, is it because they're closer? You know, is it because they're closer to their clients and they know, you know, and I, I'm not saying that dealerships are, but, you know, they're just more flexible and nimble. It, in some cases, they can just adapt quicker IMTs and get, you know, when, when you're a, a big old dealer group and sometimes it is like sort of navigating or turning the USS Nimitz into the turn it because it, it's just such a big operation to try and get everybody bought into processes, get it geared up, get it done. You know, so it's interesting. We've, we've certainly seen a, a small increase uplift this week and activity starting to happen. And 90% of it has been coming from IMT sector. So uh, that's quite interesting uh, that, um, that's happening. So um, just one of the other, just probably the final point, and we'll probably then just talk a little bit more about, um, you know, the auditing. So uh, just a bit more of a general industry point, I suppose. So customer experience is everything that, you advocate and i know in your consultancy with your, with your business partners and uh, you know I, as we've got to know one another over the last year or so it's uh, it's something that you know i think the word you used a minute ago was mantra you know it's absolutely a key point in everything you deliver um as consumer confidence may well be low over the coming months how can automotive companies manage consumer expectations and communicate with them effectively on social distancing measures that they've implemented yeah um i think that you mentioned the imts there gavin and one of the services that we provide as part of the audit is that we look at the headcount and we see how long those staff have been with the business we do that for a number of reasons obviously looking at conformity and training but also for retention to see what their burn rate is and their um you know ability to look after the good people that they've got and i think typically we know that the imts tend to be quite stable with their workforce you tend to see the same people i know when we go to the um you know awards ceremonies and the um independent garage association um events locally it's the same people you do see them again and again and and the dealer issue of course is still attrition they do go through their after sales people not quite as quick as sales but it that, that burn and obviously in terms of training that's a positive and a negative positive it brings new people into the business and that's a good thing negative our customers like to see the same people they like a bit of consistency they like to build that relationship so i mentioned about you say social distancing and what's been implemented etc and some advice from us well never more so now we used videos for evhcs so mm -hmm. when the technician goes around the vehicle and introduces themselves and points out obviously following a 10 15 point safety check they use the camera to do that and that's been building trust with our customers full transparency great way and to some some brands have got fantastic sales figures on the result of using that well i think what we're going to start to see now and something i'd be looking to champion is that we use the videos to welcome customers before to get them ready that you're going to meet me and this is the different experience you're going to have when you come in please allow enough time make sure you've got your service book and your spare key etc mm -hmm. then the update which we're used to doing but then actually to use the video after the event as well i mentioned about test drives with um, master technicians and things like that well again if there's a, a light that comes on when we go hard around a corner over a bump get the customer to video or passenger to video what that light is and that can be a much more simpler way of actually identifying ah i understand exactly what that is let me help you with that so that 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 use i think is part of the after sales care um i i my microwave packed up last week i lasted two or three days without it and i kept going to the cupboard where it is and realized right i now need to get a microwave so we we got it bought it bought it home unboxed it 
um, put it in sort of one, one brownie point from the wife and then the clock wasn't set right. No. So to set the clock, that would have meant unboxing the polystyrene, getting out the user guide, finding what page it was. So instead I just went on YouTube. Man. I went on YouTube. I found the video in probably a minute and I updated the clock for the correct time in 20 seconds. Yeah. And we just trust what we see more than what we read or what we hear. Mm. So that's why YouTube is the phenomenon that it is. People like to watch little short videos about what they do. And, you know, I got a bonus point from my wife for setting the clock. I felt pretty good about myself. Once again, I managed to do something without the user manual that probably I could and should have done the right way around. But hey, I wouldn't be in the motor trade if I did it right first time, would I? Yeah. So th this, this adaptation of YouTube and videos and letting people see what we do, how we work, I think is, is going to be huge for the future. And we don't just have to use it for the selling. We can also use it for yeah. the care side as well. And, and, and that could help us enormously with this social distancing. Mm -hmm. Near where I live, and I know you, you kind of know the area where I am, we've, we've just had a bit of a neighbourhood discussion over the fences, is uh, the 5G mast. We've had a huge 5G mast gone up. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a towering piece of infrastructure it really isn't so you've got a lot of coronavirus you've got a lot of coronavirus cases in your area then have you i'm not going to comment on that you can <laughs> say that gavin i'm <laughs> saying none of that all because of the fire um, yeah. who knows this one hasn't yet been burnt anyway mm. but um you know that 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 itself as a piece of technology is going to give greater and better access the experience the speed is going to you know allow people to use their phones again in, in a different way and we as an industry, if we start to think about right, mobile phones, using the recording, sending information to the customer in a video format, rather than a service reminder going on a letter, you know, or a text alert that are we sure they're gonna watch it? We're in the mind of a lot of the people who supply the video products for us, there's three or four main ones mm. I can think off the top of my head, they provide a link to say it's been watched, so you know that somebody's seen that video. And yeah, yeah. I think that's good. We're already geared up for mobile payment. I don't think my generation is going to see complete cashless. Whether it will be my children, I don't know. But we are moving towards less and less cash. And you go into a supermarket now and try and pay by cash and you get frowned upon. They look for that contactless. So I think as an industry, we're ahead. We're ready for that already. I know um, it's always a bit of a titter when my children collect their birthday present or Christmas present from my mum. Then it comes in the form of a cheque or a postal order, Gavin. Yeah. Now, you should see their faces when they get a postal order from their nan. They're like, what uh, am I to do with this? Oh, they like the pound coins that used to get sellotaped into the card. Like you know, inside, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Used there must to be a lot in there. Because heavy. the cards were heavy, yeah. So, well, one had come loose oh, exactly. and rattling around in there. Yeah. I think um, on the back of all of this, then, is to measure that satisfaction. So if they're happy, if we've done a good job, they're more likely these days than ever to tell us. With the, with the influx of um, Revu and um, TripAdvisor, people like that, they want to comment and say they've done a good job. Yeah. And that, again, becomes that form of advocacy that if we link it to our website, people will dial up, they'll look on, and they'll see just what other people have said about their business. What, are we good yeah. at what we do? And is it recent? Are there a few of them? And when we get it wrong, how do we deal with it? And all of that is absolute best practice it works so well in other industries restaurants thinking of straight away so you know we, we measure we provide a tool for measuring feedback and again it's done remotely there's there's you know no pieces of paper no pen to pass yeah. over to somebody so being smart about gathering that feedback for customers again all starts to answer your question about what you know what good looks like really how can we try and improve the service experience for the customer once we understand the predicament we're all in and you know to to make sure that we are implementing those social gap and measures so doing that self-check i think looking at the processes working with the people um taking advice and the guidance and then adapting it for what best works in our business is is, is absolutely critical and i think put some of those measures in place and we should be ready and we're geared up good for business from day one mm. yeah absolutely so just um touching back i know um across all the um, consultancy you do is quite a broad area isn't it with you around the business but um, in terms of uh, just um, going to one particular point with the MOT side of things the um, 
there's been some discussions recently more about um I think there's some stats that come out on a, on a call I was on a couple of weeks ago, reference that actually a lot of garage equipment um, providers or servicing may, that may cause a problem moving forward. Um, the potentially predicted that up to 25% of VTSs out there may fall, fall shy um, of being able to you know, make the most of these MOTs that could be coming back in because their gas analyzers are uncalibrated or, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things like that that I think, you know, people are going to potentially miss the opportunity. You know, what, what would you what would you think, what were your thoughts around get, getting that in, in line? Yeah, well, when we go on site, we typically do a one-day audit, um, meet with the people and then walk the site and then start to gather the evidence. So, you know, Part of the strategic thinking for us actually is thinking that actually how much can I do before I go on site so I'm not so involved when I am on site. But generally there's six areas we'll look at when we arrive on site. We do the premises and the signage and some of that we can do without even going into the building just to make sure they've got the regulatory displays and there's you know certainly sufficient parking, et cetera, for people to do business. That tends to be a kind of, they're on board with that, Gavin. They do it, they know they need to do it, they're okay with it and the signs the worst happens is they get damaged or they get faded and they've got to be replaced. Yeah. Um, in terms of the next step, and that is management and staff. And is the manager doing all the things that they're supposed to do? So we'll abbreviate that SM, the site manager. And again, he or she has a, a real responsibility in this self-regulating world to make sure the staff are trained, you know, the staff are complete in, as you well know, in your sector, that they're, they're absolutely the best they can be they're up to speed they're, 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 they're checking everything they're supposed to do they do the annual training but actually is there a bit more that they're doing the next area that we do is one of the areas of fall down and that is the paperwork and documentation they are supposed to keep copies of the exhaust gas analyzer the diesel smoke meter the rolling road the um the, the ramp safety etc plus all of the tools mm. that that equipment needs to be calibrated and a lot of them will use external companies to do it and I'm afraid some of the sites just, they're, they're on an auto replenish, as you will. They'll, they'll have that work done for them. But if there's any slippage, they'll blame the supplier. They'll yeah. blame that external company. And, and I've lost count now, Gavin. I used to keep a check of, you're not going to believe this, but they're only trading with an uncalibrated rolling road. Well, it happens yeah. more than you believe now. It really yeah. does happen. Yeah. And, and I'm afraid, you know, our, our colleagues at DVSA, there's no excuse for that. They won't say, oh, well, okay, you're busy. If we have got this potential influx you're saying somewhere near three million vehicles come through if we've got that then there's no slippage you can't say i didn't do it because i was busy you have to have calibrated equipment and yeah. one of the checks that we do and people say oh it seems a bit semantic it's a little bit tedious well actually i want to see that certificate there's five or six pieces of paper that i really want to see and mm. i need to make sure that it's linked to that piece of equipment you know that it is up to date and, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's a regular area of fall down. So we look at tooling, we look at calibration. I do a check of the nominated testers paperwork. I make sure that the vehicle that's on the ramp at that time, is that the vehicle that's on the job card? Is that the vehicle that's logged on to the uh, testing system to make sure we've got that continuity? Because again, my goodness, I'm sure we've all got stories of testers, bless them, getting distracted and testing the wrong vehicle. And again, that's a whole hornet's nest to unpick and the ministry don't favour anything like that. The last one, just in summary, we'll go into it as you want, but is quality control. They absolutely must have a good, robust, documented QC process. Mm. And again, the sort of people that you use will know that, and they'll want that, and they'll ask for it. Mm. And if they're not being QC'd, then there's a gap there. Mm. And that's one of the services that, you know, as part of the checking we go and we have a look we provide templates and documents etc if they haven't got it and one thing i like about what we do is that if we find that maybe there's some gaps then we'll help them do that before we leave so whilst we're on site for that day we actually go and do a lot of the extra work that gets them over the line and in readiness then for when if they are audited directly by ae from dvsa yeah no no, that's great. I think um, thanks for thanks for the today, Colin. It's, um, you know, the MOTs are, you know, as we all know, is a is something that's um, you know some people see in the industry as a, a money making tool. Um, but actually, for us, uh, as you well know, um, it is paramount in our business safety. You know, that's the main thing. That's what it's there for. 
um, and you know, um, 450 vehicle uh, technicians and MOT testers we have going around the country. Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and profess that every single MOT tester that um, does 100% all the time because we're all human at the end of the day. But you know, there are some uh, some horrors out there that they see, um, and I think you know some of the things that you you do here at the moment are certainly again part of the trade sort of saying you know well i couldn't get hold of my garage equipment company i couldn't you know they're not available and it's like well actually the one of the guys from the garage equipment association was on there and was saying well actually my, most garage equipment organizations i know are actually still open and on where this myth of them not being available to come out and calibrate your stuff is coming from so um you know i appreciate there may be some different regulations or rules in place as to when they can come in and do it but again i think you know you have to be very careful that it doesn't fall into that where there's a blame you know i'll blame someone else i'll blame the dvsa i'll blame boris johnson i'll blame yeah, the garage equipment you know yeah. It's your business, you own it, you run it, you know, it's your responsibility to make sure that the, the boxes are ticked. Um, you know, and there's people out in the industry that are there to help, advise, guide, you know, um, and, the, and the DVSA at most. You know, I think a lot of people are very, see the DVSA sometimes as, you know, coming in in gunships and swinging from helicopters on ropes through windows, smashing through windows. And, <laughs> You know, it isn't the case at all, you know, and, the, you know, they are there to help, they're there to to assist. And, um, you know, and I think if uh, if the trade's really, uh, really honest and keen to try and get back to uh, get back to some sort of normality, whatever normality is going to look like in the, in the coming months, then, you know, there is obviously going to be geared up and ready to take advantage of that. And if they don't, then they're going to miss the boat, aren't they, you know? Yeah, I think you're right. In summary, the smart ones will always know what to do. It's the the also runs that I'm afraid will fall foul, and they might cause the problems for the rest of us. Mm. Um, so, but yeah, being being there as a partner to help and support is you know what we've done for twenty odd years. So very excited to see what the future holds, and still available to do the work that people want. Yeah. You know, countrywide. Well, you know, I can um, speak. You know, I've seen your processes and the depth you go into in terms of your auditing, and you know, um, we've done ourselves, and, and obviously as we've we've been talking over years of trying to do some more work together in the future, um, um, <laughs> this couldn't have come time for us really, just when we were just starting to uh, to gather some momentum. But you know, everything you do, do you know, I think is a uh, you know, you, you go into absolutely every detail and I don't think I've seen anything else out there at the moment that sort of uh, comes close to what you guys offer. So, you know, if anyone would say to me and, and support and assistance and, you know, give Colin and his team a call at uh, Formative because uh, without a doubt they will be able to help you. So thanks again for today, mate. It's a pleasure. And, uh, enjoy the weather. And, uh, yeah, we'll do. We'll speak to you soon, okay? Thank you. All the best. Bye. Bye-bye.